We leave the last minute or so of Rick Perry to take you live, as promised, to New Hampshire and a town hall meeting by Republican presidential candidate, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, appearing tonight at Molly's Tavern and Pub in New Boston, New Hampshire. Live road to the White House coverage on C-SPAN. Go, baby. We're from uh, Somerville. All right. Center, uh, Governor Christie. Thank you. We have here a real New Jersey boy. Yes. <laughs> He's a real Jersey boy from Newark, New Jersey. Um, he went to the University of Delaware, got his law degree at Seton Hall, and he has a long biography which I will not go into. He's going to he's going to explain himself. But I remember the first time I ever heard him speak. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is refreshing. He tells it like it is. And he's using that as his campaign motto. And believe me, this is the third time I've seen him, and I know he will tell you it like it is. I'm Tony Green, and I am the chair of the New Boston Republican Committee. Thank you. <clears throat> if you... If you've never been to one of our meetings, we meet at Whipple Library the first Thursday of every month. Please come and see us. We have some great speakers. I try to get as many candidates as I can, and we welcome you. So I'm going to turn this mic over to Governor Christie. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Well, you know, it's, really, uh, it's really great to be here tonight. I, I just first want to introduce um, the best thing that happened to me during my four years at the University of Delaware, I came out with a bachelor's degree in political science and a wife. Um, the First Lady of New Jersey, Mary Pat Christie. I'll tell you, one of the things that I've enjoyed the most so far about this campaign is the fact that uh, Mary Pat and I have been able to meet so many extraordinary people. Uh, and when I go back to New Jersey, people ask me all the time, you know, what's it like to campaign for president of the United States in places like New Hampshire and Iowa and South Carolina? And what I tell people all the time is that it will renew your confidence in the American democracy. I, and that's the first thing I thought about when I started, when I came around the corner from the car and saw all of you down here at the bottom of that little incline. You know, America should see this, and I hope they do, because here we are on an August evening, on a Wednesday night, and so many folks from New Hampshire out here tonight to listen to a candidate for President of the United States and to try to help make your decision about who the Republican nominee should be and who the next President of the United States should be. And for people who get cynical about our system of government, we all do sometimes, and man, people in government earn it. They earn that cynicism. Right? But let them see this, because this is what our democracy is all about. This is what the Tocqueville noticed as he traveled around America, about how engaged Americans were in the way they were going to be governed. So um, I wish my, our oldest son, Andrew, was here tonight, because as we've gone around, he continues when I come home to ask me questions about, so what it's, what's it like to run for president? He should see this tonight. This is what it's like to run for president of the United States. It's really great, and thank you for being here. I got a little guy in a yellow shirt back there waving to me. I don't want to disappoint him. We wave back. Thank you, buddy. Um, I want to talk to you about a, a couple of things um, off the top tonight, and then I want to leave the rest of the time for you to ask me questions about whatever is on your mind. I've done a bunch of these town hall meetings in New Jersey. I'm over 130 in the time that I've been governor. Uh, and some of you may have seen some of those or excerpts of those on 
YouTube and on the computer, they tend to be somewhat raucous affairs um, at times. Uh, but I'm much more comfortable in answering your questions and, and finding out what's on your mind. But here are two things I want to talk about off the top. First is if you watch the debate almost two weeks ago now, and I assume if you're here, you probably watched the debate too. Uh, only 24 million of our fellow Americans were tuned in that night. And um, if you remember the interaction I had with Governor Huckabee, um, I want to revisit that for a second because, um, first off, it was a very civilized disagreement and exchange, and I thought that was great. Uh, it was really good. Uh, we have differing opinions on this issue. Uh, and Governor Huckabee came up to me afterwards during one of the commercial breaks, and that's the stuff you really wanted to see, by the way. You, when you all were watching Fox make a lot of money from commercials, <laughs> they should have given you an option to pay a little bit more to watch what we were doing during the commercials. But one of the things that happened was Governor Huckabee came up to me and after that interchange, there was a commercial break, and he said to me, thanks for such a civilized exchange. And I said to him, you know, I've known Mike for a while, and I said, Mike, you're civilized with me, I'll be civilized with you. And that's the way it should be. But the shame of it was that we were an hour and five minutes or so into that debate before anybody brought up entitlement reform. Now, here's why it's a problem. 71% of the federal budget today, as we're sitting here, 71%, of that federal budget is being spent on entitlements and debt service. Yet we spent the overwhelming amount of time, except for that one question, on the other 29%. So why is that? It's because politicians are scared to talk to you about it. Because we have to reform the entitlement system because the government has failed you on entitlements. The government told you if you paid into the system They'd keep it in a trust fund. And that money would be kept there for you until it was time for you to retire. And then it would be paid back to you with interest so that you could help to support your retirement. Well, here's some bad news, everybody, that you already know. There is no trust fund. There is no trust fund. The trust fund is filled with a stack of IOUs from the federal government. And since we're the ones who fund the federal government, it's IOUs from ourselves to ourselves. Those are the worst kind of IOUs. You gotta, you gotta pay yourself back. The fact is that, you know, my disagreement with Governor Huckabee is he says, well, we can't change entitlements because if we do, that'll be, that'll be absolutely confirming lying and stealing by the government. And I say to Governor Huckabee, here's the bad news. The lying and stealing has already occurred. So this is like, this is the classic of closing the barn door after the horse ran out. And the fact is, we got to get that horse back in the barn. It's not acceptable to allow what's happening to Social Security and Medicare. So I've suggested the most detailed program, in fact, the only program anybody's offered on entitlement reform. None, and imagine this, this is kind of hard to say you're the only person who's offered a plan when there are 16 other candidates in the race not counting the five Democrats, so 21 candidates in the race, there's only one, and you're looking at him who's put this forward because it's too scary to put it forward for other people because they're afraid they're going to get you upset. See, I feel differently about it. I trust you. I think you already know the truth. You know the truth about this already. You know what needs to be done. You just need to have a leader who's going to say, okay, let's move in this direction and do it and be trustful enough in you to tell you the truth. And so we need to raise the retirement age for Social Security and Medicare. You know why. Because when those programs were developed, people's life expectancy was in the mid to late 60s. And now the average life expectancy of a woman in America is 83 years old. And the average life expectancy of a man in America is 79 years old. I see a couple of ladies smiling. Now, I want you to know that a decade ago, you had a six-year lead on us. Now, a decade later, it's down to a four-year lead. We're gaining on you, ladies. And here's the bad news. That four-year vacation you were counting on, you may not get it. You may have to put up with us for your entire life. But the good news is that we're living longer lives and better lives. That's a blessing. It's a blessing that we have more time on this earth to share with our family and our friends and to do so in good health. But what it means for these systems is that we're taking money out of these systems 15 to 20 years longer 
than they were intended to have money taken out for each individual. Well, we know that doesn't work. It can't work. And so what do we need to do? If we raise that retirement age, and here's what I propose we do. We raise it two years, and we phase it in over the next 25 years. So that means eligibility would go up one month a year for the next 25 years. One month a year for the next 25 years. So what's that tell you? It means that people who are on Social Security now, not affected at all. People who are very close to Social Security may be affected in their eligibility by a month or two or three. That's all. It's going to really matter and help the solvency of the system for the kids who are here, for the young people who are here, who maybe now are in their teen years or their early 20s. It's going to make the system more solvent for them. It's going to make it available to them. I remember a young man coming up to me here after a town hall meeting here in New Hampshire. He's 23 years old. He told me he had just gotten his first job out of college. And he said, you know, Governor, I'm glad you're dealing with entitlements because I see that FICA deduction in my paycheck. And I think to myself, what a joke. Social Security is never going to be there for me. We want Social Security to be there for that young man, and we want him to feel confident in the fact that if he's paying into a system, he's going to get something back in return if he needs it. If he needs it, that's the second point. And I do the same thing, by the way, in Medicare. Two-year eligibility increase phased in over 25 years. Same thing. If he needs it, we need to means test Social Security. I said to a group of folks who were recently at a fundraiser of mine, they said, what do you mean by means testing Social Security? I looked around the room and I said, it means none of you will get it. <laughs> if you're rich enough to be at this fundraiser, you're probably not going to get Social Security if I have my way. Here's what I mean. And let's be very specific. If you make over $200,000 a year in retirement income, now that means you've got 4 or $5 million, not counting your home, 4 or $5 million invested that's throwing off income of $200,000 a year or more. First thing I say to you is congratulations. You've done a great job in your life. You've lived your life and you have that kind of money saved. That's a great thing. Secondly, I want to remind you that it's this greatest country in the world that helped to give you the opportunity to do that. Because no place else in the world have you had as free and unfettered an opportunity to be able to accumulate that wealth through your hard work than in the United States. And here's the last part. If you're making that kind of money, will that Social Security check make any difference in your lifestyle? It won't. See, here's what Social Security is supposed to be about. And the reason it was started, security. It was supposed to be a supplement for people's other plans for retirement or a safety net for people who had worked hard and played by the rules and paid into the system, but because of the twists and turns that sometimes our life takes, they were going to grow old in poverty. We didn't want anybody in the United States of America to grow old in poverty, to have to choose between heat and food and rent. And so Social Security can help prevent that from happening for those folks whose lives took a turn that they didn't expect, and we need to have that safety net underneath them. If we don't make these changes, that safety net may not be there for those folks. In fact, Harvard and Dartmouth just did a study that said that Social Security will be broke in seven to eight years. Seven to eight years. We're not talking about way off into the future, everybody. Now, let's contrast that with what Secretary Clinton says she wants to do. She wants to take the cap off the Social Security tax. She wants to say that you will pay FICA tax on every nickel you make Right now, it's capped at $118,000 a year. If you make more than that, you don't pay any more FICA tax. Here's the problem with that. The problem with that is, do you really want to give the government who lied to you and stole from you more money? This makes no sense to me. We're sitting here having this discussion because the government was inept and dishonest in the way it dealt with your Social Security money. So Mrs. Clinton's proposal is, give them more. I'd rather... Say, okay, if you want to get people who are making that kind of money to make a greater contribution, let's take some of the benefit away. Let's take money away from government rather than giving more money to government. I think that's a really common sense idea, and I also think it's the way conservative Republicans think. We don't want to give the government more money. It doesn't make any sense. Because you know what? They'll figure out a way down there in Washington, D.C. to spend it on something else. And then they'll come back to you again. Then you know the next thing Mrs. Clinton will do? 
She gets to be president, she'll raise the, the tax rate as well. Guaranteed. We just need a little more. You know, it's only little if you're receiving it, not if you're giving it. Then it's a lot more than a little. And on Medicare, I do the same thing, $200,000 a year more in retirement income, four to $5 million saved. Um, right now, we subsidize your Medicare premium 75%, even for those folks. Let's say for those folks, we subsidize your premium 10%. We'll still subsidize it some, but that will save tens of billions of dollars a year if we just give them a lower subsidy. They have the money to pay for it. So let's make those folks pay a little bit more for their health care so that Medicare is there fully subsidized for those folks who really need it, who otherwise would have to go to the emergency room to get their treatment. And we know that's the most ineffective, inefficient, and costly way for us to deliver health care to folks. And by the way, we're going to be paying for that too, but at a much higher rate than what we pay for Medicare. So I talk about entitlement reform not because I really want to, because I'm a politician too, and I'd like to get votes and be elected, and I know that it's risky, but I also know if you're running for the most important job in the world during a time where you're within seven to eight years of this longstanding, successful, anti-poverty program, from going broke, you better talk about it, or you have no business running for president of the United States. And so I hope when you get more people here to New Boston who are in our primary, ask them. And don't let them get away with the old, we'll study it and look at it, man. We've studied and looked at it plenty. Now it's time to dig your heels in and take a position. Tell the American people where you're at. That's what we need to do. <laughs> Second thing I want to talk about is lawlessness. Now, listen, I have a different point of view maybe than some on this because I'm a former federal prosecutor. And before I became governor for seven years, I was the United States attorney in New Jersey. I was named U.S. attorney by President George W. Bush on September 10th, 2001. The job I said yes to on September 10th, 2001 changed a whole lot 24 hours later. 24 hours later, my wife got up and did what she had been doing for many, many years since we got married. She got in the car, she drove to the train station, she took two trains, made her way through the World Trade Center in lower Manhattan and walked to her job. At this point, on September 11th, 2001, her job was two blocks from the World Trade Center. And my younger brother did what he had been doing since the late 1980s. Got in his car, took a couple of trains, walked through the World Trade Center, and then walked to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, where he had been working since he got out of college. And when that first plane hit that morning, I called Mary Pat, and she said she could see it out her window. Don't worry about it. They said it's a small commuter plane. You remember? They're telling us something new. Small commuter plane went into the Trade Center. While we were on the phone, the second plane hit the second building. And she told me that the people in her office said she had to evacuate to her basement, and she would call me later. Now, at that moment, we had three children in our lives. Our son, Andrew, who was eight at the time. Our daughter, Sarah, who was five at the time. And our son, Patrick. Um, Patrick had just turned one years old. And those five and a half hours, I will tell you, were the longest five and a half hours of my life. Because for five and a half hours, I didn't hear from her. One building fell, the second building fell. And there were all kinds of reports of explosions and bombs in other parts of lower Manhattan that turned out all to be wrong, but I didn't know that. And I kept calling, I couldn't get her on the phone. And finally, five and a half hours later, I got a phone call from her from a, from a bar payphone telling me that she had made her way out of lower Manhattan to further uptown and could I figure out a way to get her home. Well, we figured out a way to get her home and thank God my brother too. Um, but our whole lives were changed that day. Lawlessness, the lack of respect for the laws of our country. It started in earnest that day when people so disregarded the law that they felt they could hijack commercial airliners, fly them into buildings, kill thousands of people, uh, and that they did so in the name of a religion. 
Well, my job from that moment forward was to make sure that lawlessness was ended, was to enforce the law, and was to prevent any acts of terrorism from happening again on our watch to kill Americans. And I just wanna make sure that you all understand, let's remember for a second, the gravity of the losses that day. If we gave a moment of silence for every lost soul on 9-11, just one minute, we know now it's been nearly 14 years since that attack. Those families have gone 14 years without their loved ones, without their husband or wife, their mother or father, their son or their daughter, their brother, or their sister. But if we gave just one minute, we'd all be willing to do that, right? We'd be more than willing to give a moment of silence. If I asked you all to stand up and give a moment of silence, here's what would happen. If we have a moment of silence for each, each and every one of those lost souls that day, we would be sitting here in silence until 9.45 p.m., 9.45 p.m. on Friday. Straight. If we gave each one of the lost souls just one minute, those families have had 14, minutes of si 14 years of silence from their loved one. See, I got into a little spat with Senator Paul on the debate stage, a little, little less civilized than my back and forth with Governor Huckabee, but only because Senator Paul decided to be uncivilized. That's okay. See, we guys from New Jersey are versatile. We can be civilized if we need to be. And we can be less so if we need to be as well. But the reason I was so direct with him is because I almost lost my loved ones that day. And we lost a good friend of ours in our parish that day. He died in the World Trade Center. Our oldest son's best friend's dad was killed that day in the Trade Center. And we've watched that young man grow up now. And since the advent of Facebook, every year on his father's birthday, he puts his father's picture as his cover picture on his Facebook page, and he writes underneath it, Dad will never forget you. Well, we can't forget his father either. And we can't have other people in our country, cannot have other people in our country who have to suffer the same fate these folks did. So I say, yes, I care about civil liberties very much, and I treasure our Constitution. But we can protect the homeland and protect our civil liberties at the same time. What they did in Washington, D.C. to stop the NSA from collecting phone records has made America weaker and more vulnerable. Understand what they were doing. They were collecting phone records. They weren't listening in on your phone conversations. They weren't monitoring your email. None of that was happening. If you listen to Senator Paul, he'd make you believe that was happening. None of it was happening. You know what happened? They collect these phone records, they match them up on a computer, and if your phone number either called the phone number of a known terrorist or received a call from the phone number of a known terrorist, then and only then did somebody like me in my old job as the U.S. attorney get to go to a court and present to a court that evidence and then ask for a warrant. And then and only then could we see your phone records and who else you were calling and then maybe get a wiretap to hear who you were talking to. But that's because you had been receiving phone calls from a known terrorist. So when Senator Paul the other night says, get a warrant, that's the way you do it. That's what an ophthalmologist says who doesn't know anything about the law. I don't blame him. They didn't teach him that in ophthalmology school. But they taught me that in law school. And what I said to him, I truly believe it's easy to say this stuff when you don't have responsibility for protecting the lives of the American people. I had that responsibility for seven years in my state. And there wasn't a day that I didn't think about the fact that one of those airplanes took off from an airport in my state. And that as the most ethnically diverse state in America, our state is a great place for people to hide because you can find someone who looks and sounds like you anywhere in New Jersey. <laughs> Believe me. And so we had to take this seriously. 
And this lawlessness, everybody, it extends to other things. We now have sanctuary cities in this country where people who are here illegally can commit crimes with impunity and hide because the President of the United States refuses to enforce the law. We have states in this country where despite the fact that marijuana is an illegal drug, people are allowed to buy it, sell it, smoke it with impunity, even though the federal books still say that it's against the law because this president refuses to enforce the law. You know, the fact is that the oath matters. And the oath I took as governor of New Jersey said, I will enforce the laws of the state of New Jersey. Not the laws I like. All the laws, whether I like them or I don't, this president doesn't have the right to just enforce the laws that he likes and ignores the ones he doesn't. That's why we have people getting killed in sanctuary cities because he's refused to enforce the law. That's why we have lawlessness. And, and you hear the governor of Colorado now even talking about the loss of productivity in Colorado. Well, of course, man. <laughs> like, are we shocked? It's so, you know, the fact is that laws matter. You want to change the law you don't like? That's fine. we got a process. Go to Congress, change the law. Go to your state legislature, change the law. I don't want to be a dictator. I want to be a loyal servant of the law. Because in the end, everybody, that's what matters the most, you know. We are a government of laws, not of men and women. You do not want us to become a government of men and women. Because when we do, it's okay. You know, it's like President Bush used to say, a dictatorship is okay as long as you're the dictator. Right? <laughs> all of a sudden, when you're not the one making the rules, all of a sudden it becomes a whole different story. So I'm going to talk a lot in this campaign about enforcing the law. Enforcing the law would solve our problems with immigration. Enforcing the law will solve our problems with productivity. And enforcing the law should give everyone in this group tonight comfort of knowing that you live under the blanket of a republic that has a president who will enforce the laws strictly and directly. All the laws. And that'll extend around the world as well. Because order in the world, shown, shown through American leadership, can help to make it a safer place. So we're gonna talk about that a lot, a lot. Um, So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop now and go to your questions. Just say this. You know, in New Jersey, we have to have lots of rules at a town hall meeting. We have four of them. I found in New Hampshire only need one rule. <laughs> you just raise your hand and I call on you. Um, don't yell out questions. Here's the thing. I don't answer yelled out questions. It's not because I'm governor of New Jersey or a candidate for president of the United States. Neither one of those things. It's because I'm the father of four. <laughs> and as the father of four, I have developed an acute ability to ignore things that are yelled at me. And given that we are just coming off five days of family vacation, where all six of us were together, that, that sense right now is very finely honed after that. So you raise your hands, you ask me questions, and I'm happy to answer them. Yes, sir. And we there's a microphone coming for you. All right, thank you, Governor Christie, for coming out tonight. Um, as a resident of Manchester, I believe that every child, regardless of where they're born, should be given the opportunity to grow to their full potential. And um, when we create partnerships, you know, joining the countries in private sector, we can build the foundation for strong, independent people and independent nations. And if elected, will you launch a presidential initiative on early, global early childhood development that focuses on malnutrition and early, early childhood education so that every child not only survives but thrives? Because these children or someone's you know, sister, brother, nieces, nephews, or you know, sons and daughters, and every parent wants the best for their children. You bet. Listen, first off, um, I just was at an education summit today yes, sir. Um, uh, that we had here in New Hampshire. A number of us went to that education summit and spoke. Um, and, and what I said was that it's 
the single most, e single most important economic security and national security issue of our time. Because right now, we rate 20th in science, 27th in math around the world, in the industrialized nations. You can't be at that level and expect to still remain the number one economic and military power in the world. And so dealing with it, we deal very aggressively with early childhood education in New Jersey, um, especially in our areas of great need, um, where our, our educational system is not doing well. And we want to try to get children into the education system as quickly as we possibly can. So we deal with it pretty aggressively there. And I think that each state has to look into their own, since the states are the ones that really fund, and the localities fund education, they have to set their priorities. But what I would say to folks as President of the United States is, listen, um, you can invest now or invest later. Yeah, so if we don't invest now, right, if we don't invest now and we have children who fail, it's going to cost us a lot more later on um, to do it. And so um, I would be encouraging everybody to do it on a global basis because I know that was part of your question. Yes, sir. Listen, America needs to be a leader in every way that we possibly can be. Um, but the president's role in that function is to be persuasive is to speak to leaders of other countries and attempt to lead by example and persuade. Yes. And I think it's a very important thing to do. The last thing on nutrition, um, it is a sin that we have children and adults in America every day that go to bed hungry. In a country that has more than any country in the, in the world, we have people who go to bed hungry. There are ways for us to partner as you suggested both as a government with the private sector and with charities to be able to lessen the amount of hunger that we have in our country. We know that if children aren't well fed, it's almost impossible for them to learn um, and for their brains to function in a way that they really need to. So on that portion of it, we have a lot of work to do at home yes, um, before we do more work around the world. We'll continue to help around the world, but I think we have even more work to do on the nutrition front at home um, and in partnership, as you suggested, with private sector and with charities to be able to make sure we fill that gap of people who are hungry. Because uh, when folks go to bed hungry in this country, um, they become less productive citizens. And quite frankly, I think it's a sin for us to allow that to happen in a, in a country with so much, with great plenty that we have here in this country. We shouldn't have that happening. So thanks for raising the issue. It's very important. Right. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. I think he's coming right. Come on over. I know, that, I know that you've said that climate change, you believe climate change is real. I was wondering if you think it's a real threat to our country and if you have any plans um, to fight it. Well, yeah, let me be clear on my, because I get this, I get asked this a lot. So let's be clear about what my position is. Yes, I believe climate change is happening um, and I believe that humans contribute to it. I don't think we're the only contributor to it and I think that climate has changed for a very long time. Climate is changing all the time. And so what do we do to try to make sure that it doesn't change in a way that becomes a threat to us? Um, I don't believe in like the apocalypse of the inconvenient truth, Al Gore movie. Not, not one of my, you know, not something I subscribe to, but, but I will tell you what we've done in New Jersey. Um, I'll give you a hint about the way I would approach it as president. Um, I think we've got to try to reach clean air goals. That's just good for people's health. You look at what's happening in China right now, there are days when people in China can't walk around without surgical masks because of the pollution that's going on in China right now. We don't want to have that kind of situation here in the United States, and we shouldn't. So in New Jersey, for instance, we've already met our clean air goals for the year 2020. And we did it by, while pulling out of something that you're still in here in New Hampshire and the rest of the Northeastern states called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a cap and trade, essentially, program and a tax um, we're the only northeastern state to have pulled out of it. Pennsylvania never joined it. Um, we pulled out of it because I thought we could do it without having to tax people. And so what have we done? 53% of New Jersey's electricity is generated by nuclear. We got to start looking at nuclear again, everybody. We got to like take a deep breath about Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island happened when I was in high school. Okay, that's a long time ago now. And so the fact is we need to keep looking at nuclear. It can be done safely. If you stay on top of the maintenance of those plants and the regulation of those plants, it can be done safely. And 53% of New Jersey's electricity comes from nuclear, so that doesn't add to climate problems at all. Here's one where if you go to a bar, if you come back here, you know, maybe this weekend, um, you can win a bet with anybody, I guarantee you. 
Ask them to name the top three states in America in solar energy production. The good thing is you'll be nervous after the first two because everybody guesses California and Arizona, and they're right. But who is number three? The great garden state of New Jersey. Yes. No one will guess that. No one will guess it. But New Jersey is number three in the country in the production of solar energy. We in the government partnered with the private sector with tax credits and incentives to put forward a really vigorous program on solar energy because we believed that solar energy was the best of the alternative energies for us to invest in that people would buy and support and that could be effective. And so we partnered with our energy companies, we partnered with private business, and the government provided tax incentives. And now New Jersey is the th third largest producer of solar energy in America. That's helping us get to our clean energy goals, obviously, as well. Fourth is, we have now are in the process of building three new gas-fired, natural gas-fired electricity plants. Um, a cleaner burning fossil fuel, really available to us because of the Marcellus Shale right over in Pennsylvania. It's become less expensive. And in fact, in the last 18 months, energy costs in New Jersey have gone down 9% because we're relying more on natural gas along with the other aspects that we told. So my view on this is that there are ways for us to reach our clean energy goals without making us non-competitive. New Jersey's energy prices are going down. That's going to make us more competitive for manufacturing jobs and other types of jobs where energy is a big cost driver. Yet we've reached our clean air goals. You can do this without having to do things that are radical and without having to tax people even more. So I think you can be a Republican that says, I want a Republican solution to this problem, not a Democratic solution to this problem. The Democratic solution to this problem is cap and trade, tax more, um, more investment in failed, as the Obama administration has done, in failed clean energy alternatives. Let's invest in the ones that we know work. Solar is one that we know that works. And, and wind works on land. I mean, you know, um, in one of these other states I've been visiting a lot lately, Iowa, I've been driving around Iowa, there's a lot of windmills in Iowa. You couldn't put a windmill in New Jersey. I mean, you know, we are the most densely populated state in America. We've got 8.9 million people in a state that's about that big, right? <laughs> you put one of those windmills up in New Jersey, it's going to be a major problem. Um, so, but let's invest in those things that make sense so that we acknowledge that we have to be stewards of this planet. This is a gift to us from God, and we are temporary stewards for the next generation and the next after that. So we need to do that, and we need to acknowledge our role in all this and try to get better. But I'm not going to do it in a way that's going to put America at an economic disadvantage because I also want you to get a job. I also want you to keep a job. I also want you to be able to support your family and do it in a way that is competitive with the rest of the world. So that's the way I would approach it. Those are my feelings on, on the issue. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir, I'll give you mine. He's close enough. Um, based on a premise that if this were, say, 1936, and we knew what was going to happen in Europe, wouldn't we have done something to stop it? Today that is happening through ISIS. Innocent men, women, and children are being butchered. What are you willing to do to stop it? And thank you for coming to New Boston, the gravity center of the world. There you go. <laughs> all right, you're all going to have to explain the gravity center thing to me later. That's all right, though. I do feel quite tethered to the ground, so maybe that's it. Um, if I had told you three years ago that we'd have a terrorist force that would be beheading Christians because of who they believe in. Uh, you probably would have told me you wouldn't have believed it. But that's what's happening right now. Right now. Christians across the Middle East are being beheaded, not for anything they've done, not for any territorial type of incursion they've made, not because of any insult that they've made to Islam, but because they're Christian, because they believe in Jesus Christ, they're being beheaded. Now, America has to be a leader in the world. If we're the place that puts in its first amendment to the Constitution, the idea of religious freedom, and the provision that says the government shall not establish a religion, you know, it's both. 
the power of our Constitution is that not only do we say you should be able to worship God in the way that you see fit, that your soul and your conscience leads you to do, but we also say, and by the way, our government has no business in telling you that we have a national religion either, because we know that could have a chilling effect on your ability to freely believe in the God that you believe in, in the way you believe in it. And so ISIS is an extraordinary threat. And let's think about this. The president said the ISIS was the JV. Um, the ISIS was not on the high priority list of Secretary Clinton as Secretary of State. They all said this was not a big deal. Well, it is a big deal. So here's what I do. First is, we've got to learn from what happened in Iraq. And what I mean by that is, that America cannot become an occupying force in the Middle East. Whenever we become an occupying force, we wind up being disrespected and we wind up causing even more problems in the region than we started to. So the first alternative I would pursue is this. The Jordanians who had their pilot burned alive in a cage, believe me, they want, they want to take care of ISIS. The Egyptians, the Saudis, and the Emiratis. They all want to take care of ISIS, and they're in their neighborhood. So we need to provide leadership to those four countries. We need to say to them, listen, first, we're going to arm you with the most sophisticated weaponry we can give you to take these people on, first off. <laughs> Second, we need to say we're going to train you, and not at the high general level, down to the battalion level, on how to use these weapons and learn the techniques that the most sophisticated fighting force the world's ever known. Third, we need to provide them with intelligence because ISIS is not a nation state, right? It's in Syria, it's in Iraq, it's in all kinds of places around the, the Middle East. So we have to improve our intelligence capability and provide that intelligence to those countries so that they can find them and kill them where they are. And fourth, we need to provide the air power of the United States, which is greater than any of those countries, to soften up those targets when we have the intelligence of where they're to be so that when those troops move in, they're moving into a softened target that they can kill. Uh, and I would want to give them the opportunity to do this first. Now, if they could not do it on their own, then we got to go and finish the job. Because if we don't, they're coming here. We know that. And so it will not be my, my option of first resort, but it will be my option of next resort. And I think that's what the American people would want because the number one job of the President of the United States is to protect the lives and the security of the people of the United States. And I think even this president, who still does not have a strategy for how to deal with ISIS, and this Secretary of State, former Secretary of State running for president, who says she'll get back to us on that one, she'll get back to us on the pipeline, like she'll get back to us on a number of other issues that she just doesn't want to address or deal with. Um, we need to have a leader who's going to say, I have a plan, and we're going to execute the plan. And you know, from hearing me talk about these issues, that I spent seven years of my life trying to make sure that terrorism did not come back to the United States of America. And I did not invest those seven years of my life and the lives of the men and women who worked for me in federal law enforcement to give that away to ISIS, what we prevented with Al-Qaeda. Um, it's just the same organization under a different name that hates Americans for being Americans and for loving freedom and liberty and for being willing to stand up for it in other parts of the world. So first, let's arm our friends, let's train them, let's give them the best intelligence and let's give them the air cover they need to fight the fight on their own because guess what? They don't want to live under that type of rule either in any of those countries. But if they cannot finish the job, then the United States of America needs to go over there and finish the job under strong leadership from a strong commander-in-chief. Yes, sir, right there. He's coming up behind you. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir. Um, I think one of the things that would make America great is to bring back jobs in this country. A lot of people today go to college, like my son, and we can spend anywhere from forty to $50,000 per year. Now, these kids are coming out of college, and some of them just don't get jobs. Why can't we keep some of these great 
jobs in America and stop exporting them to like China and all these other places? Why can't we lower the tax brackets for the major corporations to keep the jobs here? Let them be profitable and let us bring the young folk so they can survive. Instead of paying rent, they can buy homes. You're singing my song, man. I'm with you. Here's what, here's what I've already... I, and, and by the way, this is something that is personal to me and Mary Pat. We have two children in college right now. Our oldest son, Andrew, is getting ready to start his senior year at Princeton. And he's nervous about getting a job. And, you know, for that school, we're paying $60,000 a year. And our daughter, Sarah, is going to be a sophomore at Notre Dame. We're dropping her off this weekend to go back for a sophomore year. That school is $62,000 a year. So I just, during my five days off, we were just writing those checks. So I'm glad this is the Gravity Center. Because my wallet is much lighter than it was before. So I need this extra gravity here in New Boston. Here's what I proposed. I put forward a very specific plan. And for all these things, the plans that I talk about, um, you can go to my website. They're all detailed there. ChrisChristie.com. If you're having trouble sleeping, believe me, it'll help you. But it'll give you all the detail that you need. All the detail you need. But here's what we need to do. You're right, and I'll start with where you were. We have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Now, how is it at 35%? How is it that the country that perfected the free enterprise system now is the greatest taxer of the free enterprise system in the world. It's crazy. It's because we have a president who believes that all wisdom and answers reside in Washington, D.C., and that he gets to pick the winners and losers. And the way he does that is to tax all of us to a higher rate, use that money to pick the winners and losers himself. I say we need to lower that corporate tax rate to 25%. That'll put us right in the middle with the rest of the world. United States doesn't need to be the lowest rate, we got a lot of other advantages to doing business here. But if we're competitive, we're going to keep a lot of those jobs here. Second, we need to lower the individual tax rates in this country. Now, we can't do that cheaply, okay? It's going to cost us doing some other things. Here's what I've proposed. Get rid of all of the loopholes and deductions, except for two. The mortgage interest deduction and the charitable contribution deduction. We want to continue to encourage people to own homes. We want to continue to encourage people to donate to charities that help others around this country and around the world. But all the rest of them, goodbye. And then lower the rates to 28% as the highest rate and only have three rates. 28% is the highest rate and 8% is the lowest rate. And then pick one rate in the middle. I'll negotiate. <laughs> Doesn't matter. One in the middle. Have three rates. Imagine rates that low, how much more of your own money you would be able to keep. But in addition, you know that the tax code right now on the individual side is rigged for the rich. It is. And we as Republicans should admit it. It's rigged for the wealthy because the wealthy are the ones that use most of those loopholes and deductions. Regular everyday Americans don't. So let's get rid of them. The wealthy have never done better than they've done under Barack Obama, ever. Amazing, right? The guy who claims, who, who complains all the time about income inequality. And the wealthy have done better under Barack Obama than any other president in recent times. So we need to lower those rates. And imagine how quick you could do your taxes. Here's how much you made. Here's how much you paid in home mortgage interest. Here's how much you deducted to charity. There's the number. Multiply it by whichever bracket you're in. Send your check and you're done. 15 minutes, you've done your taxes. You know what that helps to do? Not only will it lower your anxiety in preparing your taxes, but can you imagine how many people I can fire from the IRS when I do that? That's going to create economic activity as well to help keep jobs here and create more jobs here. Third piece is regulation. This president has regulated more than any president in American history. In last year alone, in 2014, they issued 81,000 new pages of federal regulation in one year. 81,000 pages. Their own Small Business Administration now says that the cost of federal regulation for each small business in this country is $10,000 per employee. That's a hidden tax. That every small business owner, whether you're an ice cream shop or a bicycle shop, whether you are a garage that repairs cars, or no matter who you are, $10,000 per employee to comply with federal regulation. So we're going to do, if I'm president, the same thing I did as governor of New Jersey, because I had the same mess that I inherited. Same kind of mess. Big, regulating, liberal Democrat that I replaced as governor. In fact, the person who was his environmental commissioner 
became the EPA administrator under Barack Obama. So that's all you need to know about what I confronted in New Jersey. So on day one, I signed executive order number one freeze any new regulation from any department or agency of the state government for 90 days. And then I sent my lieutenant governor out to hold a series of public meetings around the state with business people to say, which are the worst regulations that are costing you the most and giving the least benefit that are driving you the most crazy? Give us the list and let us get rid of them. And in my first year as governor, we got rid of one third of the regulation that was put in place by my predecessor with the stroke of a pen. We can do the same thing as president. That will be, I guarantee you, that will be executive order number one. Close your eyes and picture it. I'm in the Oval Office on January 20th, 2017. After I walk in there, look around and go, oh my God, I'm here. Then, <laughs> then I will sit down at my new desk and that executive order will be the first one on a stack of executive orders that I will sign freezing any new regulation from any agency or department of the federal government and then sending my vice president out to hold a series of public meetings to find out which federal regulations are the ones that are absolutely re restricting our ability to create more jobs in this country. And then when he, he or she comes back with that list, then we'll get rid of them the same way I got rid of them in New Jersey. That's the way we'll create and keep jobs in this country. Last piece is energy policy. And it gets back a little bit to this lady's question as well. We gotta have an energy policy in this country that says we're gonna exploit the assets that we have make energy costs lower in this country. That's gonna bring manufacturing jobs back because the manufacturing jobs that went to China and went to Mexico went there because of cost of labor and cost of energy. Well, we don't wanna change cost of labor because I don't want people making you know, minimal money that's not gonna help them have the lifestyle they need in this country, but we can now compete and win on energy costs if we get natural gas out from under the ground, we have a 100 year supply, get oil out from under the ground, have greater investment in alternative energies and lower the cost of energy in this country. We lower the cost of energy in this country, manufacturing jobs will come back because we have great skilled labor in this country to do it. And they'll pay for that if they know their energy costs are gonna be lower and we can be much lower than China or Mexico on the energy front. That's the way we create jobs. That's what's in the plan that I put out. And that's what I'll do as president of the United States to help us get jobs. Yes, ma'am, back there. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to sort of to piggyback off that gentleman's question regarding uh, college education and the cost and the rising cost. Yeah. Um, we have two daughters and I'm sure many people in here um, have, share the same concerns as how can our children get a college education and not be swamped with debt when they graduate or how can we avoid you know spending all our retirement and remortgaging our house yep. um, just to give them that college education yeah no listen this is an this is an issue that we've talked about a lot um you know i'll start where i ended on the college uh, on the college question with him we, you know mary pat and i have two children as we said in college right now so we understand exactly what you're talking about and in fact you know, eight or nine weeks ago, you know, we got this letter from the University of Notre Dame. And uh, it's great, right? First, for, it's from Father Jenkins, the president of the University of Notre Dame. First paragraph was something like this. He said, we want to thank you for the blessing <laughs> of entrusting your child's soul to us here at the University of Notre Dame for education over the next four years. You know, like it's from a priest, right? And it's at Notre Dame you can hear the music from Rudy in the background, right? <laughs> As you're reading that paragraph, you can see touchdown Jesus, right? The golden dome, the whole thing, my heart's pounding. It's just, and of course, because he's a priest, the next paragraph's the money paragraph, right? I'm a Catholic, I know it, right? So here's the thing. The next paragraph he says, and that's why we're so proud to let you know that tuition this year at Notre Dame will increase only 3.9%. Now, remember, inflation is like one, one and a half percent, right? Only 3.9 percent. Here comes the kicker, though. She says, which is the lowest rate of increase in 40 years? Now, think about that. A nearly 4 percent increase in tuition, annual increase in tuition, is the lowest annual increase that Notre Dame has had in 40 years. It's insane. So let's talk about a few things about how we make college more affordable. First is when our students take out loans, they should be able to renegotiate those loans if rates go down. And right now they're not allowed to do that. That's wrong, it's wrong. The federal government is making money off of student loans right now because they're charging seven, eight percent rate to our kids and their families when they borrow the money at two, three percent. Not right, 
We should be able to, you renegotiate your mortgage, you can, you can refinance, you can refinance your car loan. No reason that these kids should not be able to refinance student loans to bring down their costs. Secondly, we should give them a national service option to work this stuff off. And not just military service, but a national service option in addition to military service that says that if you want to invest a number of years after you graduate in serving your country in various different capacities, you can pay off those loans through your service. I think that's an option for a lot of kids that they would want to take. Um, we'll give them great experience. Um, in addition to that, especially because of this gentleman's question about the job market being tighter, this might be a way where they can be really productive and get some of that debt off their back. But we also have to get less of the debt that's on their back. See, I think the shame of this is that we accept the bills that we get from colleges. Now, I said this, this past week, I just paid the bills, right? I mean, the, it's ridiculous, this bill, right? Tuition, room and board, other fees. <laughs> That's what the whole bill says. And then it's a $61,000 bill. Now, you came in here to Molly's tonight. If you guys went in there and had dinner, right? If you went in there and had dinner and they came back to you with a bill, let's say for $100, and all the checks that when it came back was food, $100, <laughs> all right? You'd call the waiter back over and go, <clears throat> excuse me, um, could you just kind of detail this out for me so I know exactly what each thing costs and what I got and make sure that what you say I got, I actually got, all right? We do that for a $100 bill. We don't do that for a $61,000 bill from a college. We just accept this three-line bill. So first, they need to detail what they're spending their money on to us. Now, I talked about this here in New Hampshire, um, and my daughter was with me. My daughter, Sarah, who's a Notre Dame student, she was with me, and I said, you know, for instance, what if you found out that 1% of the budget this year was being spent building a rock climbing wall? Because I thought this was a ridiculous thing, right? My daughter grabs me from behind. She goes, um, we already have a rock climbing wall, Notre Dame. Now, listen, I know a lot about our daughter. One thing I know for sure, she ain't climbing that rock climbing wall. I know it. I know Sarah. She's got lots of skills. She's got lots of interests. One of them is not the rock climbing wall. Maybe we don't need 40 vice presidents for paperwork. Maybe we don't need all these things that colleges have just been allowed to do. And if they had to tell us what they're spending the money on, I think they'd be embarrassed. And I think we'd see those things being reduced. So they need to give us a chance to unbundle that bill. Let's say our daughter goes to college and says, you know what, Dad, I'm not really into the whole social scene or the extracurricular scene in Notre Dame. I basically go to my room after classes. I work. I go to the library. I go to class. That's what I do. Right? I mean, that's of course not true, but, um, <laughs> but in dad's perfect world, right? But you have a lot of kids who commute to school, who live at home, you don't, you know, why can't you just pay for what you're gonna use? Why not unbundle it and give a checklist? And by the way, this would be a great market test on what they're providing. If 85% of the students say, I don't wanna pay for this, well then maybe you shouldn't have built it in the first place. And maybe you shouldn't build a second one next time. But right now what's happening is there's no market forces on college tuition. The last reason why there's no market forces on college tuition is us. So our daughter goes to Notre Dame, she loves it. I mean, she loves it. She sends me pictures to my phone. Dad, look how beautiful the Golden Dome looks today. Look at first down Moses, look at touchdown Jesus. I mean, she sends me these pictures as she walks around campus. She told me when she came home for Christmas break, I obnoxiously love my school. Right? Now, this is great, warms the father's heart. But when the bill came in, if I came to the conclusion, imagine if I came to the conclusion, you know what? Notre Dame's just not a value anymore. For what I'm paying, I'm not getting enough in return. Imagine that. So imagine that conversation with my 19-year-old daughter. Sarah, I know you love your school and everything, but I'm not going to use name another school because I'll insult that school. But we think that school X is a better value. So you're leaving Notre Dame and you're going to school X. I don't know how many of you in this audience have teenage daughters, but I suspect you would agree with me that after the crying and the I can't believe you're ruining my life and the stand at the feet and the running to her room and the slamming of the door, you know that if it is that in any way possible, you and I are sending her back to Notre Dame <laughs> because we know she's happy there and we do know she's getting a good education. We want the best for our children and they know it. They know it. 
they know they got us. So we need to, and, and how would I do this unbundling and make sure it happens and the greater detail? Here's the kicker. If you don't do those things, you cannot have students at your school that participate in the federal grant and federal loan programs. You want our taxpayer money? You need to be transparent to us and give our parents choices, and our kids choices to lower these costs. So that's the way I'd go about it. Unfortunately, for you and I, it may be too late. Because I won't be president for another 17 or 18 months or so, so it may be a little bit too late. Yes, ma'am, right there. Thanks, Governor Christie. I have two very essential questions for the future of our country. Okay. Number one, what is your favorite Bruce Springsteen song? <laughs> Number two, what is your favorite pizzeria in New Jersey? All right. This is someone who obviously knows the things that are very important to New Jerseyans. And me, personally, yes. Well, my favorite Bruce Springsteen song, without doubt, is Thunder Road. And the reason Thunder Road is my favorite song is it is the first song on my favorite album, which is Born to Run. And if you have access to this song, now this is be a New Jersey favor you could do for me. If you have access to the song, go home tonight and listen to Thunder Road. The reason I like Thunder Road starts right at the very beginning. Close your eyes and listen to those first few notes of Thunder Road, and it sounds like a song that's welcoming you in. Welcoming you into a new world that you're going to explore over the next eight songs with this guy. Oh, heck no. <laughs> there was a request for me to sing. I will do almost anything, as you all know and have seen on television any number of times. Singing? Mm, acapella? <laughs> no. Not good for me, not good for you. Um, Thunder Road. A favorite pizzeria in New Jersey? There, I have to go with two because there's one of my youth and one currently, all right? So of my youth is a place where I grew up in Livingston, New Jersey, and the place is called Camaradas, and it, they made the best pepperoni pizza I ever tasted in my life. It's tremendous, and they still make a really good pepperoni pizza, and my mother used to buy that for us on Fridays, not in Lent, Fridays, not in Lent. In Lent, we couldn't have the pepperoni on it, but on Fridays, because she says she worked all week, and she's like, I'm not cooking on Fridays, and she always got that pizza, and we loved it. And currently, we have this great pizza place in our own town where we live now called Dante's. Our kids love that pizza. They love getting it all the time. Um, I'm eating less pizza than I used to, unfortunately, but um, those would be our two favorite pizzerias, one from my youth and one from, from there. I, I'll tell you one last thing. Bruce Springsteen, born to run. Two weekends ago, it was the 40th anniversary of the release of Born to Run, 40 years ago. And I can remember being a 12-year-old kid in New Jersey and going to Sam Goody's record store. Well, we used to have record stores, right? To Sam Goody's record store and going in and buying that album and opening it up, the front of it, and seeing this incredible picture of this young bearded guy in a black leather jacket and a big African-American saxophone player and I listened to those songs, and the thing that made it different for me was because being from New Jersey, every once in a while, we get a little picked on. And I listened to those songs, and those were songs about people I knew and places I knew. And when Bruce then later on that fall was on the cover of Time and Newsweek on the same week, he was no longer just our little hero. He was a national figure now, and it made us proud. And so while Bruce and I probably agree on maybe one or two issues politically, <laughs> on a really good day. Um, he has become a friend over time and was incredibly helpful during Hurricane Sandy uh, for our residents. I got to know him during that time. Um, and he and his wife and his children are really wonderful folks and great representatives of New Jersey, even though we belong to different political parties. So thank you for asking me about Mr. Springsteen, one of New Jersey's favorite exports. All right. This guy right here, the Nike hat on. Good evening, Governor. Good evening, sir. Um, we know our partnership with the Global Fund to fight uh, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis has a proven track record of success. They save about 100,000 lives a month. Um, we have the resources to end these epidemics. Uh, what we lack is the political will. So as president, will you make sure that the U.S. Uh, commits its full one-third share of the Global Fund? Yeah, we will. And, 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 and I'm really proud of the fact that the person who really 
brought the fight on AIDS to the world stage um, in a big way for America was President George W. Bush. And I think if you talk to leaders in, in that movement, like I have folks like Bono from U2, who's been one of the largest voices in especially the fight against AIDS around the world, um, a guy named um, Ray Chambers in my state, who's a UN ambassador, who's been the guy leading the fight and raising money to fight malaria in Africa, a, a very wealthy, successful guy in my state who's led that fight. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that when you think about it, these are all Republicans who have led this fight. Um, and I, quite frankly, I, I got to tell you that Democrats tend to give this lip service and Republicans tend to write checks um, on these fights. I don't think as long as we have the way to cure and treat these diseases and treat in the, in the case of AIDS and save lives, that, that we can walk away from that. Um, from that. I don't want to see people dying around the world needlessly. And the United States both, but, but this is why, and the flip side of what I want to emphasize to folks when we take on that fight, is to say that's why we have to protect the patents and the profitability of our pharmaceutical companies in this, in this country. Because it is the American pharmaceutical companies in the main that have taken the risk, invested the money in research and development to develop these treatments. And then you have some folks in the other party who are constantly attacking those corporations and belittling them and yelling about their profits and their costs when they're the ones who take the risk to put billions of dollars into research and development to come up with these cures and these treatments uh, that we then can export to the rest of the world. So my deal with the American people would be this. I'm happy to invest and put our full share into, into those type of things and, and other things as well to help to fight disease around the world, because I help, think it helps to make a more peaceful and prosperous world as well when people are healthy. But in return, what I want is let's, let's lower the heat on the pharmaceutical country, uh, companies in this country. Let's be supportive of them. Doesn't mean that they, you know, we, everything they do is right, because there's nobody in the world that everything they do is right. No person, no corporation. But the reason this stuff is available to us is because they've been willing to take the risk to do it. We need to acknowledge that and acknowledge them for that. So we can do this together and help the rest of the world. I think we should. Uh, and I believe that, you know, our party has been the party that has helped to lead that fight. And if I'm president, I want to try to end that fight because I think it's a fight worth ending. So thank you for bringing it up. It's really good. Yes, sir. Right there. Uh, thank you, Governor, for coming to New Boston. Thank you. Uh, what would you do to bring honor back to the uh, veterans of this country? That's my first question, because this presidency seems to have lost that. And the second question is, how would you straighten out the VA? Thank you. Well, first off, on honor, I'll take it in reverse order. How about that? Um, to straighten out the VA, the first thing is that we have to acknowledge publicly that we made a promise to veterans. That promise was, if you volunteer for service in our military, or for our older veterans, if you were drafted into service for our military, and you put yourself in service of our country and put your life on the line, we promised you in return to care for your medical needs for the rest of your life. Not if it was convenient, not on our time schedule, but for the rest of our lives, we provide you with that service in return for your service. So for the VA, first thing I would do is to fire those folks who have been responsible for the incompetent handling of this. This president's only fired one person. There's a lot more people who deserve to lose their jobs over this. Second, I would go around the country during the transition and look for the finest hospital executive that I could find in the country and then ask that man or woman to come and volunteer some of their time to come back and be the new Secretary for Veterans Affairs. Because what the VA has become in the main, is a provider of health care. So why not get the very best hospital executive we could find in the country to look at what we're doing in our VA hospitals across this country and our VA other medical service providers and get that person to come in and task them with a the job of straightening out the VA and its system. Third, because our veterans shouldn't have to wait for that to happen, um, I would expand what's being done now. Every veteran should be able to take his or her card and go to any health care provider in this country and get medical care. We're always gonna need VA hospitals because they provide some specialized care, as you know. And so we're always gonna need VA hospitals, but you shouldn't be restricted to just a VA hospital. Now, in terms of bringing honor 
back to our veterans. Not only is it about the way the president himself conducts himself and his interaction with veterans and conducts himself as commander in chief. So our veterans feel proud of their service because of the commander in chief they have. But let me tell you what, a couple of things we've done in New Jersey that are concrete to let people know about how much I care about making sure our veterans are treated the right way. Uh, a number of years ago, about three years ago, we started a program called Vets for Warriors. And this is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week hotline for veterans who are having mental health issues. It's run out of Rutgers University Hospital in New Jersey. It's run nationwide. And you know who mans those, call those phones? Veterans who have been trained to deal with fellow vets who are having mental health problems. Now, this was a partnership between the state of New Jersey and the Department of Defense. But this past spring, the Department of Defense, if you can imagine this, sorry, eliminated the funding for this program. And this July, the program was going to close. And I just wasn't going to let that happen. So when I heard about it this spring, when we found out we couldn't get money out of the federal government to do it, I went to the two leaders of our legislature, both Democrats, who at times I don't always agree with. And I went to them and I said, listen, we cannot let this program close. And I said, for $3.3 .3 million, we can keep this program open for every veteran around the country. And I have to give credit to both these gentlemen. They never hesitated for a second. They looked at me and they said, Governor, that's exactly what we need to do. So we all put it in the budget together. I signed the budget, and now that program is still running at the expense of the taxpayers of the state of New Jersey for the entire country and for veterans all across the country. That's how strongly we feel about our veterans in New Jersey. And secondly, since we're advocating this CARD program, we've decided to start a pilot program in New Jersey with our acute care hospitals, our trauma care hospitals. They're, we're giving $5 million from the state to these hospitals, they're matching it with philanthropic money, and they're guaranteeing for any vet who's been denied care at a VA facility in New Jersey, if they come, a New Jersey veteran comes to one of these hospitals and presents themselves and says, I tried to get care today at a VA hospital, I couldn't get it. They guarantee that that vet will get care that day in that hospital, and that's a partnership between the philanthropic supporters of those hospitals and the taxpayers of the state of New Jersey. So we put our money where our mouth is when it comes to our vets. Third and last example, is that a lot of these vets who come home with drug or alcohol problems, mental health issues, um, they wind up really hitting bottom and they become homeless. Now in New Jersey, we always had a, a homeless place for veterans. It was called Veterans Haven South. It's in the southern part of our state. Well, one of our larger psychiatric hospitals was gonna be closed in the northern part of the state. And they suggested that we sell the hospital uh, to a private facility. Um, I decided no. And what we did with that facility is we opened Veterans Haven North so that the veterans in the northern part of our state would have a place to go to. And the upside to that is since most of them have drug and alcohol dependency problems, there is a dr private drug and alcohol counseling facility on that property. Instead of kicking them off the property when the psychiatric hospital closed, we said you can stay on the property as long as you promise in return to us, forget rent, in return to us, you provide drug and alcohol counseling to any of the homeless vets who are staying at Veterans Haven North. They agreed, and we now have a partnership up there where homeless vets have a place to go, a place to sleep, a place to get fed, and a place to get mental health and drug and alcohol counseling to try to get themselves back on their feet and back becoming productive citizens again. Those are the things we're doing in New Jersey to help vets. We'll take the same approach as President of the United States. All right. My staff tells me I can take one more question, which means I will take two. <laughs> the reason for that is I want to remind them that I am still the boss, <laughs> especially since you mentioned Springsteen before. We got to remember who the boss is and who it isn't. All right, ma'am, right here. I'll give you mine. Thank you, Governor Christie. And I just want to preface this question by saying that in my 20 years of voting eligibility in this great country, you are the first candidate to really inspire not only myself but my entire family to get out there and vote for the, can the election of 2016. Um, one, one issue that my whole family has been dealing with recently is the Obamacare issue and I'd love to know um, if you could speak a little bit about how you feel about it and might, how might things change if you were to take on. 
Sure. Uh, first off, uh, Obamacare is a failure and it needs to be repealed and replaced. So let's start off with that. But it's not enough just to say that. You need to say why it's a failure and how you'll replace it. See, every Republican will say Obamacare is a failure needs to be repealed and replaced. Okay, great. That's really good. That means you got the handbook. Okay? What you all have to be demanding up here, and the rest of the country is counting on you to demand it. You got to ask for more than that. Because you're the presidential wine tasters for the rest of this country. And especially now with 17 of us, you're going to vet us. So vet us. So here's why. First, because you cannot have a program out of Washington, D.C. that handles that large a piece of our economy in 50 different states with 50 different sets of needs run out of Washington, D.C. It was bound for failure. And I can remember when they were first coming up with this thing and they wanted us all to open Obamacare based state exchanges. And I was refusing to open an Obamacare state-based exchange in my state. And I got a call from the White House. And they said, you know, Governor, we really would like you to open an Obamacare exchange. And I said, I'm not going to. And they said, well, come on, you're a reasonable guy. We should do this. You should partner with the president on this. And I said, no, because here's why. I said, you want me to start a program where I have no control over the rules and no say on the budget but all the responsibility for whether it's successful or not. I gotta tell you everybody, there's no good executive in the world who would ever accept that deal. None, not a good one. No good executive in the world would ever accept it because you have no control over the rules, you have no control over the costs, but you got all the responsibility because if it goes south, they're not going to call in Washington. You get a bad exchange in New Hampshire, you're, you're calling the locals here and saying, what'd you guys do to mess this up? So. I think what we need to do to replace it is to go to a completely state-based system. Now, let's take our two states, for instance. Now, New Hampshire and New Jersey are relatively, ge you know, geographically relatively the same size. You have 1.3 million people, give or take, here in New Hampshire, right? They're spread out. You know, there's a lot in the southern part of the state, but there's also a good piece up in the northern part as well, the north country. Um, and your problems in New Hampshire regarding health care are mostly access, and a lot of that access has to do with distance, right? So now let's take New Jersey. We're about the same size. We have 8.9 million people. In about the same space, you have 1.3 million people. Our problems for healthcare are not about access. You trip over a hospital like every four miles in New Jersey, right? And we trip over each other in New Jersey because we're so densely populated. Our, our problem is cost. Our access point is cost more than its distance. Well, why would we think that one program out of Washington, D.C. could fix those two problems? It, it can't. Why should we try to do it that way? You know, the Constitution of the United States says that anything that's not enumerated as a power to the federal government in this document reverts to the states. I don't see health care in the Constitution of the United States. Don't see it. Right? So, so I'm willing to make the governors and the legislatures in each one of these states responsible for coming up with a health care program that deals with access and cost in their states. Not optional, they gotta come up with a program. Now, you know, I might not necessarily like the program that your governor comes up with, because she and I don't agree on a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> but the fact is you got a Republican legislature that can help to do some different things here. Um, and you know, the same way like we trip over hospitals in New Jersey, what I've learned in New Hampshire is you guys trip over state reps. Yeah. <laughs> right? You got 400 of them, right? I mean, yeah. now, here's, now here's the good news, though. Here's the good news. You can get to them. You can't get to these people in Washington if you don't like Obamacare. But you don't like something they set up in this state, man. You, you'll find state reps all over the place that you can get to them and say, I don't like this. You can get to your state senators. You can get to your executive counselors. And you can even get to the governor in a state like this. Um, you can't do that in Washington, D.C. So I believe each state should be tasked with the responsibility of coming up with a plan that works for their state, their unique population. We have the most ethnically diverse state in the country. We have the most densely populated state in the country. That presents a whole bunch of different healthcare challenges. So we need to have a plan that's adjusted to New Jersey. I trust the governors, Republican or Democrat, because they know that people, unlike people in Congress, who are accountable to no one, right? I mean, I saw a poll the other day that said 13% of the American people approve 
of the job Congress is doing. And I'll tell you something. The only thing I was surprised about was I said, who are those 13%? <laughs> right? Like, who are those people who are going, hey, 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 that looks good. I like that. All right? You can't get to those folks. They're not accountable. You can get to the people here. And I think that the government that's, that's done most closely to the people is the government that's the most effective kind. And on health care, we should not be allowing the federal government to take over this. It was a mistake for it to happen. And the next president has to change it. But they have to change it by also addressing the health care needs of the American people. Let our states do it. That's the way it should be done. That's the best way to bring change and the best way to bring opportunity to this. All righty, all righty. Let's get this gentleman right here for the last question. He's, she's coming up right behind you. Governor, thanks for coming to New Hampshire. Thank you, sir. I was wondering what your opinion is on H-1B visas. Um, Disney re recently laid off their whole IT staff, made that staff of American citizens train foreigners. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric did the same thing. Qualcomm did the same thing this week. I think it's wrong, yeah. and I'm in IT. It's not helping jobs. Now, here's the thing. We have an, an, not only H-1B visas, we have an entire immigration system right now that doesn't emphasize quality, doesn't emphasize fairness, um, doesn't emphasize employing American citizens. We have a system now that's totally run amok. You know, we spend most of our time, unfortunately, I think, talking about the border situation. Now, the border situation is a problem. And I've talked in detail about what I think we need to do to secure the southern border. I'm not going to spend time in response to your question going through that, because that's not what your question's about. But we spend a heck of a lot of time talking about that. Um, and it makes, I think, the American people seem smaller than we are. The fact is that we need to talk about the entire system, and we need to talk about legal immigration. And what are we going to do about legal immigration, and how do we make sure that it's controlled in a way that benefits our country and the people of our country? And on the H-1B visa side, or any of these things, we haven't even had that conversation. We're not even talking about it. I will tell you that this is my either 17th town hall meeting or 18th up here. You're the first person that's asked me about H-1B visas. The But we also need to do something that's going to make sure that the American worker is getting a fair shake. And right now, folks feel like this immigration system, no matter where you are, a high-skilled person like yourself or a low-skilled person, they all feel like they're being taken to the cleaners by a system that does not take their interests into account, is not fair. And by the way, it's not seen as fair by people outside the country either. It's broken it's a mess. So I think what we need to be able to do is to first secure the southern border stuff so that we make sure we lower the temperature a little bit. Because no one's going to want to talk about your H-1B visa problem until we secure the southern border. A, a president's not going to be able to do that, even have that conversation, until we deal with that issue. But then we've got to deal with the whole issue of legal immigration. And here's the last thing I'll say about it, is because I think the protection of the American worker is extraordinarily important, especially given this gentleman's question about how hard it is to be getting jobs for anybody right now, whether you're a young kid out of college, you're a middle-aged guy like us, or no matter who you are in between. Um, we also don't want to ever be seen as a party, or as a country, as an anti-immigrant party or country. Um, this person looks to me, um, as it is to many of you here, I mean, um, my grandfather was born on the boat between Sicily and the United States. And, you know, imagine that for a second, right? That means that when my great-grandfather, who was a Mason, and was having trouble getting work in Sicily and applied to come to the United States legally, when his ticket was finally called, my great-grandmother was nine months pregnant. And they got on that boat anyway. They were so hungry to come to the United States and have an opportunity and do it the right way. That when that ticket was called, they want the chance to pass the guy on the boat. I'm like, can't even imagine my great grandmother giving birth on that boat on the way over here. Now, this used to be a real cause between my mother and her dad, because my mother was a smart aunt, and, and she she went on, she used to tease my my grandfather because she said, You're nothing. 
You're not Sicilian, you're not American, you were born in the ocean. <laughs> you're nothing. And now my grandfather died um, when I was very young. I was about nine years old. But my grand I can remember this. This is one of my few memories of my grandfather. He used to get red in the face and get really angry and say, that's not true. I'm an American. They made me an American when I got to Ellis Island. My grandfather was so proud of the fact that his mother and father and he, involuntarily, but nonetheless, <laughs> did it the right way. And he came over and he became a Mason as well. And they worked to help to build New Jersey, where they settled. We don't want that, that part of our country's story to ever be obscured or to come to an end. But we gotta do it in a way that's fair to the people who are here, and work hard and play by the rules, got educated, did the right things, and want to raise their families. And that's the conversation we have to have. And one of the things that bothers me right now about the conversation we're having on immigration is there's too much heat, not enough light. And your question is a perfect example of that. No one talks about that. Yet it's really affecting folks like you and others who are well-trained and need to do this work. Go ahead, you My fiance say. can't get a job because there's so much competition from H-1Bs. But something he could raise in the next debate with Senator Rubio is, I, I read that he wants to triple the number. We don't need that. Right. And, and, and just one other point? Sure, yeah. And sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Uh, back to Social Security. How about getting Congress to pay into Social Security? Well, I'd really listen, like to see that. Listen, you know what? You're talking to a guy who, who doesn't understand why Congress doesn't have term limits, and I do. Okay? Somehow... The governor of New Jersey, the president of the United States is dispensable, but members of Congress are indispensable. Members of state legislatures are indispensable. Somehow Obamacare is good for the rest of the country, but Congress can buy themselves out of it. Somehow, in my state, I don't get a pension, but members of my legislature do. Like, I'm not asking for a pension, but they shouldn't be getting one either, okay? And, and so, you know, we've got to have it. And, you know, we blew it as a party too, by the way, because in 1994, we had the contract with America, and one of the things was that all the rules that Congress passes will apply to themselves. We forgot about that somehow. And this is why people get so cynical about Congress, and why I do too. Because you're darn right that that's exactly what should be happening. And instead, they make special rules for themselves. And, and I don't understand why we as the American people should put up with that. They serve us. So I think there should be term limits, 12 years for everybody in Congress. 12 years. And if you, can't, if you can't get it done in 12 years, man, go home, right? Doesn't matter. I have a guy in my state legislature, get ready for this. He has been in the state legislature now for nearly 42 years. Huh, man, get out, right? If you haven't done everything you wanted to do three times in 42 years, it's time to go. And so that's part of the problem that creates the issue you're talking about. These guys down in Washington, they, it's, I guarantee it's something in the water. I don't know what it is. I'm going to have New Jersey water trucked into the White House. I can guarantee you that. Thanks a lot, Governor. You got it, buddy. All right? And so we need to have a Congress that um, has the laws that apply to them, but also has the, 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 feels the need to be in touch with folks like you. Thank you. you know, five state troopers and this guy's helped me out here. That's good. Um, here's, the, here's the thing. The biggest thing is that Congress loses touch. They lose touch with people. And they don't know your story. And they haven't heard your story. And part of the, the job of a governor or a president who has the executive authority is to make sure, and that's why I do these town hall meetings all across New Jersey, because I want to stay in touch with folks like you to tell me real stories, not about the theories that you get you know, pitched to you, whether it's in Trenton, New Jersey, or in Washington, D.C., but about how these, these, these policies, or lack of policies, really affect real people and their families. So thanks for raising that. You. And you're a, first, you're a first timer on that. And I didn't think I was going to get a first time question tonight. Um, well, first off, Thank you for coming in the daylight and staying until it's dark. This is my first outdoor in the dark town hall meeting in New Hampshire. I hope it will not be my last. And I want to I want to just end um, by saying two things. First is to end where I started, which is to say thank you 
for being such an incredible example of the greatest democracy the world's ever known. This state reinvigorates my belief in the fact that we're getting it right and we can get it right if we work together, we work with each other, and we care enough about the future of our country to spend the time we need to spend to pick the right leaders. And so you're doing that and I appreciate it very much. Um, second thing is this, I, I think, you know, you'll go to chrischristie.com, you'll look at the website, you'll fall asleep the first time, you'll get back up, you'll read it again. You'll go through all the specific plans that I have on there and all the different, and it's important for you to see it because seven years ago, a majority of the American people voted for a bumper sticker. We voted for hope and change, right? Hope and change. Sounds like great words, but if you knew hope and change meant the weakest economic recovery since World War II, if you knew hope and change meant a nuclear-armed Iran, if you knew hope and change meant more wars in more places in this country than when this guy came into office, if you knew hope and change meant a health care system that was broken and wouldn't serve you, in fact, would take more of your money and give you less health care in return, if you knew that that's what hope and change meant, we would have went running for the hills. So this time, I'm challenging all of you. You better figure out what the man or woman who's offering themselves into this job is gonna do if they get there. And the only way for you to do that is to demand that they tell you now what they're gonna do when they get there. So that's why we're putting all that detail on the website, not just to help insomniacs, but also, and we care deeply about insomniacs in this country, we do, but it's not just to help them, it is also to make sure that you know, when I show up on January 20th, 2017, you better know what I'm gonna do. And then if you complain to me, I'm gonna go, ha ha, I told you. I told you this is what I was gonna do, so no complaining. I told you, you voted for me, now I'm gonna go do it. Second thing though is that I can't tell you everything that I'm gonna do. Because we don't know everything that's gonna come across my desk. The one thing we know for a president of the United States is George W. Bush thought he was gonna be the education president. And he spent his first eight months passing No Child Left Behind and working with the other side of the aisle to get really good education reform in this country that he was fighting for. And then all of a sudden, one morning he wakes up, he's reading to a group of school, ch school children in Florida, and radical Islamic terrorists fly airplanes into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and he became a wartime president, and the president who was gonna fight terror in this country. So you don't know. He could have never told you what he would do to fight terrorism. You weren't asking him in 2000. And you weren't because we didn't know. So how do we make this decision then? How do you decide between the 17 of us? It can't just be the list of issues. It can't just be my record as governor, because everyone's got a record. You look at it, you look at the good and the bad. It can't just be that. You gotta know who we are. That's why this process is so important, the way you do it in New Hampshire. Because you've got a chance to know who we are, more than anybody else in the country. So I'm gonna end by telling you who I am. You know, I'm the, I'm the son of an Irish father and a Sicilian mother. Yeah, I hear some grumbling, all right? For those of you who are grumbling, you know what that means. That means that as the oldest child in that family, I became expert at an early age at dispute resolution. <laughs> Let's just say that, you know, my house was a loud place and my parents were both very emotional folks who were able to really put their feelings out there. Um, my dad is now 82 years old. There's Tim. We live streaming this thing, Tim? Where are you, Tim? C-SPAN's got it too. God, my father's definitely watching then. So here's the thing. My father, 82-year-old guy, still lives in New Jersey, wonderful person, great health, came with me to the debate in Cleveland, was thrilled, is thrilled about all this, and if he were here tonight, um, he'd be hugging all of you. That's what he is, big hugger. He'd be hugging everybody. He'd be telling you embarrassing stories about me from when I was a kid and doing all the things that fathers do, right? He's that kind of guy. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, um, was the driver in our house. I used to tell my father all the time that in the automobile of life, he was a passenger. Mom was the driver. Mom set the rules. Mom was judge, jury, and executioner. Mom was the driver of the bus in our house. And she had some rules. Her biggest rule was, in our house, growing up, was no suffering in silence. Now, I think she put this rule into effect so she could use it. Because she was the one who used it the most. But she used to say this all the time, no suffering in silence. If you have a problem, I need to know about it. If you're worried about something, I need to hear it. 
If you've got a problem, I want to try to help fix it. If something great's happened in your life, I want to celebrate it with you. But none of this in silent stuff. You need to tell me. And, and when we got older, after a while, it got a bit much. You know, because she'd be on it all the time. We'd be saying, oh, Mom, all right, enough. I hear you. Enough, I get it. And she'd say, no, 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 Christopher. You need to hear this now. I need to get it off my chest. She'd say to me, there's going to be no deathbed confessions in this family. You're going to hear it right now. <laughs> and so that's the way I was raised. And, and that's the way we grew up. And, and I, I said, I had a Sicilian mother because we, we lost my mom um, 11 years ago. And um, she was a dynamic person, but she was a lifetime smoker. And she smoked from the time she was 16 years old. And by the time she got to uh, February of 2004, um, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And you know, for any of you who've been through this, you know, sometimes the cancer is really aggressive, sometimes it's slower growing. For her, it was very aggressive cancer. And I was the United States attorney at the time. And I went to the United States Attorney's National Conference at the end of April of 2004. And my younger brother called me out there and he said, listen, they put mom back in the hospital she took a real turn for the worse, and they're saying, if you want to see her, you need to come now. So this was fast, February 14th to the last week of April. And so I got on the red-eye flight that night in San Diego. I flew home to New Jersey. I got home the next morning, got to the airport, got in the car, drove to the hospital where she was. And uh, I got to her room, and they had started to give her morphine. So if any of you have been through this and lost a loved one, um, you know that's the beginning of the end. They're trying to just make her comfortable. Um, and so when I got there, she's kind of in and out of things. So I sat by the bed for a while. And then finally she kind of came to. And this was typical of my mother. Now she had not seen me for a week. No hello or how are you? She's like, what day is it? I'm like, hi mom, how are you? Yes, back from my trip, good to see you. Um, it's Friday. And she said, what time is it? I said, it's 9.30 in the morning. And she said, go to work. I said, mom. I flew home from San Diego all night to come and see you. I'm spending the day with you. I'm not going to work today. And she said, Christopher, it is a work day. Go to work. I said, Mom, like, what are you, afraid of not getting your taxpayer's money's worth? Like, stop. I decided to take the day off. I'm taking the day off. That's it. And she said to me, Christopher, go to work. It's where you belong. There's nothing left unsaid between us. Other than the birth of our four children, it was the most powerful moment of my life because my mother was giving me permission to let her go. And you know, what I thought at that moment when I was sitting there was, oh, damn, she was right. I have to, I hate to admit it, but she was right. The way she taught us to be our whole lives, there were no deathbed confessions. There was none necessary. Every grievance had been aired. Every problem had been talked about. And most importantly, I knew that she loved me. And she knew that I loved her. And there wasn't anything left to say. So I did as I was told. That's what she would have wanted. I got up, I kissed her on the forehead, and I said, okay, Mom, I'm going to work. And she said, good boy. And I left. That afternoon, she went into a coma, and three days later, she died. And it was literally the last conversation I ever had with my mother. And like I said to you all, I have no regrets about it. None at all because she lived her life and taught me to live my life in a way that ended for her in the right way, in a place of peace. And so as one of the most psychoanalyzed politicians in America, <laughs> you know, like when I said, get the hell off the beach or sit down and shut up, you know, and, and people are like, why is he like that? Why does he say those things? You now know it's her, it's her. You know now, right? It's her. She taught me to be that way. And, and, and I know, and I know that if she were still alive today, to see this, like to see this circus that my life has become with the signs and the lights and the cameras and all this other stuff, I know she'd have lots to say. Two things for sure I know she'd say. First, she would say, is, so, you're running for president of the United States. <laughs> Mr. Big Shot. I changed your diapers. I know who you are. So don't get too big for me. My mother would want me to keep my head on my shoulders. She'd want me to be the person that she raised me to be. And the second thing she would say to me, I am confident, is, okay, if you're going to do this, you're going to ask these people for their vote. 
This is the most precious thing they can give to anybody outside their own family. Their vote for president of the United States. Well, if you're going to ask him for that, Chris, then you better tell him everything. You better tell him what you think and what you feel. You better tell him what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. But in a trusting relationship, that's what we do. We don't hold back. And so this campaign and the slogan is a tribute to her. It's a tribute to her, because if she were here, that's what she'd want me to be. And I gotta make sure that I keep faith with that. And that's who I am. And you need to know that. So here are the four things I know I can promise you if I'm President of the United States. All the rest of them are ideas on a website that I hope to do, but I'm gonna need Congress to help me and lots of other people, and you're gonna have to help me to get those things done. But here are four things that are all within my control that I promise you I'll do if I'm President. First, you'll never have to wonder what I'm thinking. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you. Second, you're never gonna have to wonder what I'm feeling. I'm gonna show you. Third, you're never gonna have to wonder what I'm willing to fight for, because I'll fight for it. And fourth, you'll never have to wonder how hard I'm willing to fight for it, because you'll be able to see it with your own two eyes. Beyond that, all I can tell you is I'll try my best, the same way I've tried my best as governor of New Jersey, same way I tried my best as U.S. attorney for New Jersey, same way I tried my best as a husband and a father every day. I'll do my best. But those four things you can take to the bank because that's who I am because that's the person my mother made me. And so all of us have all kinds of things that influence our lives, but in the end, we can't kid ourselves. The two most important people in our lives are our mother and our father and they form more of us than anything else in the world. And we gotta get back to respecting that in America and acknowledging it and living that every day, that the strength and the core of our country comes from God and from our families. And if we have greater respect in this country for God and for our families first, I think a lot of these other problems will fix themselves. So we're ready to go, everybody. We're ready to win this election. Thanks for coming tonight and make the country a better place. Thanks for coming and listening. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. That's a small town lawyer. Yes, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Christie. Thank you for coming. My uh, grandfather was mayor in Wayne, New Jersey. Oh, wow. And I love New Jersey. Willowbrook Ball, baby. Willowbrook, that's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Oh, great to see you. The light's getting in my eyes. Thanks, baby. Thanks for coming back. Yep. Here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you got it. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Oh my God. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Thanks for your question. Hey, thank really you. good one. Can you get a quick sure, go. <laughs> I just want to tell you I'm thrilled with how you answered my question, but I'm not looking to it. Okay. Better. Hey, listen. Right, no problem, man. I'm ready to do it. Thank you. Thank you for your question, too. Appreciate it very much. And thank your family for the support. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Ma'am? You know, not our lifetime, but we can start making sense of what we do for our children. They're going to stop adding to it and then make a small dent, which we can do. But we're not going to get out from under $18 trillion in my lifetime or yours. But we can start moving it back in the other direction. That's what we need to do, and then we'll hand it off to them to fix the rest. Great, great grandchildren might only have a smaller. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. We want to cut the Jewish boy to another. Where from? Madison. All right. We, uh, I'm sorry. She's up there. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. She's going to be here. No, it's going to take a selfie. Oh, yeah. Come on, honey. You got it. Thank you. That's my first question. Yeah. Thank you for the first question. My father was born in the first ward of North New Jersey. And my uh, uncle was Sammy Joe Sidney. 
That, no, you're Sammy Fennaro, of course. You better tell Mary Pat, because we go there all the time. It's in our that's town. My cousin. That's my cousin. Sure, that's in our town. We go there all the time. You want to get a nice small macaroni when you come up to New Boston and look this up. You got it where? Good. Good. Well, that's good. That's the same size as our town, where Sammy's is. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, sir. No, no, no. Thank you. Good. Good job. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Ma'am, nice how are you? you? Thank you. Great to nice meet you. Nice to meet you. Great to meet you. Sure. What's the camera? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Of course you can. My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. That was nice. By the way, New Boston, um, somewhere around the 1800s, some famous guy did all kinds of research on gravity. And this is the center of gravity? And they, 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 called it, they called it that on the website, that this is the center of the gravity, you gravity center of the universe. There you go, baby. That's a good thing. And by the way, you've got a great staff. Thank you. So I know you guys are getting it done. We are. We got Matt Brody in New Hampshire. That's all you need. It's very good. Thank you so much. How are you? Oh, I'm happy to be back. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, man. How are you? Nice to meet you. My pleasure. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Hey, thanks for your Thank question. You, you started yeah, off tonight. Way to go. Coming, coming over here in New Hampshire, and I really hope you'll launch the presentation this year on the We're going to try. Appreciate it. Ladies sir. next, sir. I'm going to go. Right. Ma'am, how are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Sure. Sure. Thank you very much. We really need that. Yep. And he took over. Got it. Thank you again. And I just wanted to say I'm a pharmaceutical guy. I'm being laid off for two weeks. So I get home. Thank you. Not in New Jersey. That whole yeah, the whole thing. Off. You know, so uh, you head home with me on that? Can you go in right now? Can you get a picture? Sure. Let's go. Okay, get it right here. Oh, here we go. Do you want your picture? You're up to the station. My compliments to you. Thank you. Thank you. I've, got very a buddy, I've got a buddy in Point Pleasant, and he loves you. John Walters, oh. for what you did for that state. He sings your praises. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's one of your biggest fans. So, John Walters, Point Pleasant, New Jersey. Thank you, sir. Thanks. I'm with him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I saw you at the press. That was awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was awesome. I was way in the back. I got there a little late. It was a good night. It was awesome. It was a good one. Cool. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Hey, brothers. Awesome. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> you have a New Yorker here, and you've got something you really like. Let me see. Very nice. Sure. You got it, brother. Thank you. That's a good time. Oh, you're there today? Good. Yeah, let's get a smile. Good job. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Let's make it happen, okay? We'll go back to New York strong. Awesome. Thank you, man. Rock it. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming up here. It's really great. Great to be here. Good luck. You did a great job tonight. You did. I'm happy to spend my time here. Sure did. Thank you, man. I owe you. It wouldn't be a bad place. Go up to one of the lakes. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good luck to you, young friend. We do. We'll keep at it. Good luck. Thank you. Sir. Appreciate it. Get a beer for you. Beer. All right. Well, I think I may try we to get one of those. Play, right? yeah. Thank you. I've followed you a long time. Best of luck. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that very much. Hi, how are you? I'm Erin Carter. Very nice to meet you. These are my children, Keegan. Keegan, how are you? And Kat Fiona. We're oh, trying to show them the political process. Way. So important. Thank you for coming and spending yeah. your time tonight. That's they actually really great. both watched the uh, debate on TV Excellent. and they very go. much enjoyed. And I was wondering if I could get a picture. Of course. Uh, come on, guys. Come on over here. We'll be off the Oops. same level. Now. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's a nice picture. I might have that light. Is that light too much? I'm sorry. Let's turn this way. There we go. You guys are getting your pictures taken with the next president. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And I got to tell you, I really like what you said about your mom. I might try to use that with my kids. Not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. It works for us.
<laughs> great to meet you. Thank you for coming and spending the time tonight. Very nice of you. And then this is my mother in law and the grandmother. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Great yes, to meet we you, are. Thank great you very much. Both. I had to be, uh, work late, but he very okay. much. Okay, tell him I understand uh, that. Meeting you. Well, good. Well, you tell him I'll be back, all right? All right. Thank That'd you all great. for spending the time thank tonight. I love you. are so real. I thank you. I just. I want to see you in a debate with Hillary. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Me too. You have got a great sense of humor. We'll and you, will, you will be awesome. We'll have a little fun with her. She doesn't want to see me on the other side of that I'm stage. I guarantee you. Thank you. My husband's Charlie, by the way. Nice to meet you. Thank you, yeah. you. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm totally into you. you. Good. You I'm working, working on it. You Young women are in charge. You need my hard cowboy. I'm a Giants fan. I understand. That's You're a Cowboys fan. Something like that. My dad's a Giants fan. I understand. That's a problem. Because he's an old man. So for two, trying to get past it. Work through it. Work through it. My father's been able to. Thank you, Giants. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the work you're doing in New Jersey. Thank you. Born and raised there. Where? Uh, well, born at Fort Dix. Born and raised there. My daughter. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hi. Good. So, you. Thank you so much for addressing like the cost of college and education, and then addressing too like social security in the future because I feel like. We're caught in the middle. Yeah. I mean, we pay all this money, and then I'm a social work student, so we sit in class and we talk about Social Security and how it's great and everything, and we're all just pulling our eyes. We're gonna, are we going to see it? it? Yeah. And so, if we don't change it, you're not going to. So, so thank you so much for Thank you. That's really nice. Yeah. Thanks for what Can you're doing. Get a sure, come on. <laughs> thank you. Thank Sir, you. thank you. Thank you. Sure. Just shake your hand. Thank you, man. Appreciate it very much. Thanks for run coming hard, and listening. You bet I will. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you. Happy for to making have this, you. For making the evening for us. Happy to have this you. Really, this is the most fun one I've ever had. It's pretty nice. It's really amazing. Could have been perfect, right? Really perfect. Yeah, they did, right? Just a few little matches. It was all good. Thank you. Oh, hi. Okay, come on. Let's do it. Let's do it. This is the only one that I'm going to do. Sorry, Governor. Oh, that's a bad picture. One, two, three. How are you doing? All right. Thank you so much for watching. I was in Milford. That was the first thing you made me tell us. Good. Thank you. I love it when you say about your family, your mother, and your father. She's my mother-in-law. That's my mother-in-law. Thank you, buddy. Nice to meet you, Governor. I'm glad you came to our state. Me too. Me too. Of course. Come on. Thank you. Jersey girl, boy. You got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Thanks, Sammy Sidermo. Sammy Sidermo. Tell Mary Pat. Yeah. Mary Pat. Yeah, we talk. Okay, just talk over there. You know what, my favorite candy. My father's favorite. Wait, how do you think we feel? We're Yankee fans up here in Red Sox Nation. I understand. You got a, you got top. The Mets, man. Four and a half games ahead. I know. I'm feeling good. Thank you, Tom. Really good. Thank you, Governor. Welcome to New Rick, Hampshire. How are you? Rick Olson, the gentleman yeah. on the staff, said you spent a few minutes with you on Second Amendment. Yeah, absolutely. He's the president of the Legendary Fishing Zone Club. Great. But he lives in Manchester. Oh, right. Right. Good. He's a good, good man. man. I've helped him on a lot of campaigns. Yeah. Goes all the way back to yeah. the Senate. And yeah. <laughs> good. We, uh, we have to sit down with you any time. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. 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 Let's sit down with you. Sure, any time. Yeah. And if you want to sit down with you, we have time to really sit down and go through issues. I'm happy to go through Oh, sure. All right. Yeah, that's so we'll great. be back up. I'll be back up Monday. Absolutely. So and every week. Oh, so Tom knows when I'm coming up. Okay, Whatever nice. uh, questions you have, I'm happy to answer. Because I'm proud of my record. I'm happy to talk to you. About it. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Good. Appreciate you, the buddy. time. Thank you. I'm an Paul Border. I own Molly. Oh, thank you so much for that. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you. So great. No, I mean, great. What a great phenomenal. What a great place. I mean, really, it's so thank wonderful. You. I'd love to have you in for dinner when you're up in the morning. Thank you. We will, because we're going to be back. So yeah. absolutely. Nice. Um, well, I don't know where my man went. Oh, here we go. Oh, Thank you for being here and for staying. Got it? Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. We will come back quiet without all the cameras. All right, by all means, so we on up tonight. Come back. See what my wife's doing. Absolutely. All right, thank you. This lady would like to have you. Sure, come on, of course. I already told you I was a Sicilian, but I didn't know what to do. Pisanos. Try one more. I have never voted for somebody for president that I haven't met. Good. Well, don't start now. Don't <laughs> we'll start now. I got an inside yeah. track. I'm one of the ones you've met. That's very good. Absolutely. Thank you. And you know what? Very you don't need to throw money at the interview. Thank you. It's not money. Just plenty of money. It's not money. We're a wash in money. That's yeah. not why we're here. Accountability. Absolutely. And, and expectations. Mm -hmm. Expectations are too low. Yep. And it's mostly because the parents put pressure on the 
teachers to leave the kids alone. Yeah, that's right. No, we need yeah. Got to aspire to great things for yeah. one children. I have a son who went to Dartmouth and one who went to Syracuse. So they're okay. They're, they're just okay. okay. They're okay. <laughs> they're really good. They're good. Right. It was a pleasure. It was an absolute pleasure to listen Thank to you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm... I hate to say it, a registered Democrat, okay. but of uh, all the 17 Republican candidates, I love your message. Thank you very much. Um, you're sincere, that. you're knowledgeable, um, it's it's actually just fun to listen to you speak. Good. You're, you're very, uh, and, and I like how you addressed the question that I was going to ask that I didn't get a chance to ask was about congressional term limits. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the career politicians in Washington make every issue about getting reelected and not what the people really want. So, yep. um, no, I, I'm totally for it, and I and I just don't understand um, why they think they're indispensable because they're not. Exactly. None of us are. Exactly. And if we could get rid of a president after eight years, and we get rid of a gov excuse me, am I said a governor after eight years? There's no reason for us that they should have to stay longer than 12. I'm giving them four more years than any of the rest of us. We right. should be able to get it done with that. That's well, six I'd terms be, in the I'd house. be happy with eight years. I think eight years would be reasonable. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, so do I, by the way. I mean, I think six terms in the House and two terms in the Senate. The reason I picked 12 is because it can work for both sides. Right. Divisible by both sides. So I think that way everybody's got the same rules up and out after 12 years and be done. So I think it's really important. I think it hurts our country. It wasn't the way it was designed to be. It was designed to be a citizen legislature. who would come and serve for a period of time and go back home. That's uh, what it should be. I agree. Yeah, so I, thank I you. I appreciate it. And I got, it. And I got lots Take of friends who are Democrats. Thank you. <laughs> come on. Let's okay. Go. I thought I got gotcha. you. Okay. From New Jersey, if I didn't have dinner with Democrats, I would eat alone. A lot I'm of from France. Connecticut. Right. I actually live in Connecticut. Sir, I just great came to meet you. Thank, Thank you for coming. All I appreciate right. it. Thanks for taking the time to Thank listen you. and to hang around afterwards, too. And your, mom, you. appreciate it. your mom was right. Go to work. She was right. How are we doing, brother? What's the chance of a Christy Paul ticket? <laughs> no, actually, slim. <laughs> slim. Either way, I think it would be it would be slim, right? Really slim. Oh, this is great. For me. This is that. It's kind of a great New Boston. Setting. My father graduated from New Boston High School in 1955. When they had a high school class, 14 people in the class, small town. So this is what a great setting. It really is. Yeah. Right along the Stanislaw River. Awesome. Then you've had a few bug bites, you haven't really been to the That's true. <laughs> exactly right. The long sleeves help, buddy. The, uh, the, 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 the primary is going to be in We have next. We have next. Absolutely. So, the primary anyway. is going to be in fe 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 February, and you're going to see some cold yeah, weather. Well, we'll keep working hard until then, okay? But thank you for saying it right now. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You know, I talked, I filled it out. I filled it out. Yeah, he was it was a good conversation. It was a good conversation. So thank you for your help. I, rem I reminded him of that, too. You should. I did. Yes, I did. Did you see Deb? It's good to see you. Thank you. Absolutely. Had trouble with the music? Thanks for being here. Thank you, Look at us. Yeah, man. What do we like, stalkers? Here we are. Heck no, man. <laughs> you're, the you're, you're, the, you're the ones that keep me going forward. Are you kidding? I see, that, I see your face. Hey, okay, look what Deb bought me tonight. I bought the five pack. Strong, so, strong. Did you see the news about him today? He's, he's doing great. He's got five to go. And yeah. He's yeah, he's doing really well. So I texted him today and I said, you're such a show off. <laughs> so you gotta, so you got to beat cancer then faster than anybody else, too. <laughs> Sounds very good. He's so enthusiastic. Like, he, feels, he looked good yesterday in the news. Yeah, right? Yeah. And he feels really good. I mean, you know, like he said, he gets tired and, and, and his bones are good. But he's going to go very close. That's why he's halfway through. He is. Halfway through. He really is. You know, I was lucky I stumbled over him. He was really good. <laughs> Really good. Just a little stumble. Just a little stumble over there, man. It's all good. I'm like, it's all good. That's great. I didn't know. It was a very important trace. Okay. So. All right. So we'll be back up here on Monday. Tomorrow I'll do something with a new arm in the morning.
after a couple of meetings. Um, didn't forget about Mary Burns. Yeah. And Kia wanted me to say hello to you. Oh, that's oh, great. She's town hall meeting soon. No, no, no. She's uh, looking so for the most part. Are you kidding? I've been there. Forever. Yeah. And Devin, you remember Devin? Yeah. Devin? You remember Devin? Hi, Devin. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no work. Iowa. That's what I heard. Family. He told me. He said. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. She could stay with me. Down low. I'm a down low. So this is a good luck to Sarah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. It's going to be a good weekend. Did My kids Andrew are very back? excited for corn dogs or whatever the heck they're going to Did eat. Andrew go back yet? No? Andrew. September 16th. 16th, Princeton. Oh September? September 16th. The more you pay, the more they go. <laughs> Governor. Sir, have you got time to get a deal with seven off these upstairs? You know? That's the boss. That's the boss? That's the Hi, boss. Hi, Mary Pat. Hi. I'm the we boss, got, I guess. We, got, we can get the gun and have a beer with some. We got seven oh. on duty firefighters. I don't know where we're going now. What am I doing now, here? What time is it? We're done. We're done. All right, let's have a beer. Let's go. Oh, right. my gosh. Should we bother you for one more time? Sure, come on. Thank you. Let me be in it. Yes, absolutely. Behind every great man is a greater woman. Here we go. Who's taking the picture? Oh, well. These are not the pictures. It means so much to us. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Best of luck, Governor Schultz. Thanks for coming. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Thank you. Really love it. Last guy in line here. How are you, Governor? How are you? Good. Everybody ranted and raved about education. Said it should reform should be state driven. No one went to Ronald Reagan's position of shutting the federal department of education down. Should we do that? Yeah, listen, I don't think that's the priority. I think the priority is to change what's going on. I think if you have that argument first, you're going to have a much more divisive argument and less apt to be able to get the things that really matter done, which is to get the strings off, um, to get the intrusion out, and to return curriculum control to localities. That's so a, that's you a had, good priority. You're on the same wavelength as Governor, another governor, Governor Kasich, who said, we did it wrong in the 1990s. We said we were going to kill the Department of Education. He said, everybody thought we were saying we were going to kill education. Yeah, I mean, you got to be smart about how you do so this. So how about we call it, we're going to decentralize the Department of it, Federal Department of Education in 50 directions. Uh, listen, I think at least 50. And the fact is that, you know, if you're a governor, and, and, and Kasich knows this and understands it too, they're in... They're in our pockets and in our curriculum much too much than it should be. Um, and so, you know, I think that's the important thing to get done. And I think like, if you don't tie it up with other things that are more controversial, I mean, you have a better chance of getting that done. And if we can devolve that control back to the states, the benefit that we'll get from that far outweighs anything else that's symbolic. So just just call it decentralization. Hey, well, the well, massive and go, and go, total go after decentralization. The, how about going after the actual part of the issue and not just going for the symbol? Symbolism is important. I'm all for that in certain areas. But in education, we need to get at the substance of this thing and get it fixed quicker. Yeah, but here's an argument that's very simple. You know, localities run K to 12. Yep. Run it, finance it. States run higher education, run it, finance it, yep. or it's private. You've got people in Washington who have no operational experience telling the people who have operational experience what to do. Yeah. I think the American work. voter gets that. I think they do too. Formulated that way. I think they do too, but it's not a one way conversation. And we'll have Secretary Clinton from the other side saying what that means is he doesn't care about education in America. Don't walk into their traps. There's no reason for us to walk into their traps. I've watched them do it. I'm a little more concerned about getting the job done. And and, and that's why I would take it the way okay. I take it. Great. But thank Good you. Good one. You're, you're here late. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, thank you very you much. Right, Appreciate you. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> what are you drinking, Governor? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what it is, as long as it's cold. All right. <laughs> Republican Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey live at Molly's Tavern and Pub in New Boston, New Hampshire this evening for a town hall meeting. He will be in Iowa on Saturday. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.